Well, last week we started reviewing church vision that uh, Bob was actually referencing earlier this morning. It was on my sabbatical and afterwards the Lord spoke to me and gave me an idea of the direction that we should take our church specifically and gave me six different facets of what that would look like. One of them is strengthening our congregational connections or relationships with inside the church body because the more closely connected we are to each other, the easier it is to go through times of difficulty, times of hardship, but also the more fun it is to go through good times. We need each other. We also spoke to me that we should serve the community. We talked about both of these last week, and that reporting is on the church website if you missed it. And this week we're going to look at two more, ministering to the youth and energizing the service. Next week, we'll look at the last two facets, showing signs of life in my favorite, de scary in the basement. So we shared this in January, and now that we're a little over halfway through the year, I thought we'd review, but also celebrate some of the successes we've had. This has been a year in coming, but we finally have our air conditioner Woo! working. Oh, yeah. You know, on mornings like this morning, there's a lot more energy when everybody's comfortable instead of sweltering. Churches used to always be sweltering. There was a story my grandma George always used to tell about my grandpa George's funeral. He died in July, and if you can imagine an old Lutheran church building in July with no air conditioning, it was 95 degrees outside. The pastor stood up at the beginning of the funeral service and said, now I know that all you men out there dressed in suit coats are here to honor and respect Tiny, because my grandpa's name, name was Tiny. He was only six foot three, so obviously he was nicknamed Tiny, right? But if he were here, he would have each of you take off your suit coat. So before we even start the funeral, I want everyone to stand up and take your coat off so you don't expire from the heat and join him in the grave. <laughs> There's no energy when it is sweltering hot. This is a real simple tangible, practical way, but this helps us energize our service. This is something that uh, Jared has done largely, but Bob and Steve have also helped facilitate some of that. We had to revamp a lot of the electrical in our church, and some of that's still underway. But this is one of our successes we've made already this year. And another one, if you go downstairs and look in the men's bathroom, it is a lot less scary than it used to be. And if you look at it, you wouldn't think too much has changed unless you remember how much paint was missing from the floor. And then there was the ducks that were in a row around the perimeter of it and some old early 90s wallpaper stuff going on. So Connie is the one responsible for this. And the bathroom looks much less scary, much more inviting. And you know, that's an important part because if you ever had to use a bathroom, and we all do, there are pleasant bathrooms, and there are unpleasant bathrooms. Whenever we go on our grand camping adventures, my daughters are always wanting to know, do we have a campground with flush toilets, or is it pit toilets? They have opinions. <laughs> Strong opinions. These are just a couple simple ways we're starting to make some headway. This morning, I want to look at one of these facets ministering to the youth. Now there are a lot of youth in our community. There are very few youth here present with us this morning. I was looking up the school enrollment last night in the school district. There is at Greenfield Elementary 625 students. That's kindergarten through fifth grade. At Viking Middle School there's 353 students. We have one of them here this morning, two from Greenfield. And at the high school, there's 444, and we have two of them here. So one of the things that comes to mind right away is that if God's telling us to minister to the youth, but our youth are not actually generally here in particularly large numbers, this is going to require some creativity on our part because they're not present. We're going to have to go find them. We're going to figure out, have to figure out how we can gather them together in some other place and time in the week if we're actually going to minister to them. 
So that's just their starting points. Kind of starting on the back foot, so to speak. But this is a really important element. And I want to look at something God said in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this is not a book that I read very frequently. But this is perhaps one of the most famous passages out of Deuteronomy. God speaking to Moses, and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. There's some really important meaty stuff that just came across in that. First off was the revelation that Yahweh, or the Lord, is the one true God. Remember that Moses is speaking to the Israelites that have just come out of Egypt where they worship the sun, the river, and the dung beetles, and the grasshoppers, and things like that. There were a lot of gods in Egypt. And where they were going, to the land of Canaan, there were a lot of gods. They had Ashtoreth, they had Baal, they had this Baal and that Baal and another Baal. There were lots of Baals, actually, to worship. And they were very emphatically worshipped by all the inhabitants. But God is speaking here, and he's saying, there is only one true God, and it's me. It's not any of the others. They're not actually real. He demonstrated his power over Osiris, the god of the Nile River, that the Egyptians worshipped, when he turned the whole Nile River to blood. See, the Egyptians worshipped the Nile River as the source of life, which, you know, a river going through a desert, they were kind of correct in a way. But God demonstrated that it really has absolutely no power. And I can make it bring death if I want to. And he did that day when he turned it to blood. All the fish of the river died. Nobody could drink of it. It was terrible. It smelled worse. So he's revealing to the Israelites here, there is one God, and it's me. The rest don't exist. They're not real. They are powerless, as was demonstrated. And then he goes on to give what's affectionately known in the New Testament as the greatest commandment. You have everything from Genesis through Deuteronomy known as the Law of Moses, and the great debate in Jesus' day is which of those commandments is the greatest commandment, and it's the one that comes across in this verse here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So this is some pretty heavy stuff that Jesus, or that God just spoke to Moses and to the Israelites. And then he follows it with this verse here. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You see, it's not enough for us in our generation to believe we actually have to preach and teach it to the next generation so they have a chance to hear and choose if they're going to believe as well. Otherwise, it dies off. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever run into a young child who likes to talk, and I have a few that I'm closely related to, <laughs> they like to talk the moment they wake up in the morning. They like to talk at mealtimes. They like to talk while they're driving and going places. Yesterday, we drove over to Lake Wasota State Park to hang out there as a family for a few hours. And on the way there and on the way back, Elise multiple times said, tell me a story. She loves stories. She likes hearing stories about her when she was younger and her older siblings when they were younger. And it's kind of funny because I've never thought about it before, but Annabelle gets to grow up and see all the stories of Elise's childhood, but Elise didn't get to grow up and see any of the stories from when Annabelle and Micaiah were her age, because she wasn't around yet. The only way she's going to hear about it is if she hears it from a story. You know, the Israelites had children in the desert. They had a lot of them, actually. Well over 600,000 of them. And none of them had seen any of the stories what God did in Egypt when he delivered the Israelites out. There was a lot to get communicated. First, God 
turned the Nile River into blood, and then he drew all the frogs out of the river, and they went into Pharaoh's household. It was on his bed, and in his kitchen, and everywhere else, and I'm sure that elicited lots of giggles, because children love the idea of frogs being where they're not supposed to be. And they continue on telling about the things that God did. You know, there's stories of what God has done that are communicated through the Bible. But then there's also stories that we have in our own life. And those stories are an important part of our spiritual heritage that we pass on down to the next generation. Whether they're our children or somebody else's children who's believing. There's a graph here I'm going to show you. I used this in a sermon series many years ago. Some of you may remember it. Most of you probably haven't seen it, actually. But this graph actually shows how church attendance has shifted over time by generation. So that top line was the church attendance rate of the greatest generation. That would be the generation that grew up in the Great Depression and then marched off to war and fought World War II. And um, those people are all born before 1930. Anybody here born before 1930? Yeah, so half of them go to church, but there aren't very many of them left. That would be Maxine Amundsen's age group. They're mostly gone. The next generation down is the silent generation. They didn't defeat the Nazis and the Japanese, nor were they as boisterous as the boomers, and so they're considered the silent generation. I didn't do the naming. They're born before between 1930 and 1945. Do we have anyone here in that range? A couple. Just barely. Just before the boomers. There wasn't a very large generation because there weren't a lot of people born during the war, during the Depression, relative to afterwards. But that rate, you'll notice, was just a little bit less. Through the course of their lives, they attended church anywhere from 37 to 44% of the time. And the next generation down, the boomers, that would be all the people born between 1946 and 1965, roughly. That was a huge cohort. My mother's class was the largest class in Ogden High School history in Iowa. There were more people in her class than any other class before or after. I think it was twice as large as the preceding class, actually. So it was a very large generation, but at that point, church attendance already d diminished down to about a third. The next generation was Generation X. They were born between 65 and 1980. And they were down to about a quarter. I read that graph right. And the next generation down is Millennials. They're even lower than that, about one in six. And the good news is that Annabelle's generation the next generation down, sometimes referred to as Generation Z, Gen Z, because Gen X was followed by Gen Y, which they then replaced and renamed Millennials, and now the next generation obviously would be Z. And uh, the earliest part of that generation is hitting adulthood, just the first five or six years worth of them. The good news is that a touch more of them are actually going to church on a regular basis than the preceding generation. So maybe we've hit the low ebb. But what this tells me is that from one generation to the next, a large number of church-going kids fell away and did not continue regularly attending church. And think about all the people in your generation you've known going to church. I remember in 1996, there was a mini revival in Northfield, and there was all these kids that were just a couple years older than me, but they were very much in my generation. And um, they had not grown up in the church, but all of a sudden they got saved and God moved in their lives and they started coming to church. And so they hadn't been church going kids, but they were converted and they believed and they started going to church very regularly. But that also implies that an even larger number of church that were born in the church, grew up in the church, fell away. And I know many people in my own youth group that no longer follow the Lord and regularly attend church. As this continues, we just end up with a much smaller and smaller percentage.
percentage of the population is heavily influenced by the Word of God. A small number of people that are trying to live according to the Ten Commandments, a small number of people in our society that are allowing the Holy Spirit to move in them and through them. I don't know about you, but I rely on the Holy Spirit and I live by the Word of God influences and impacts an awful lot of my week. This last Monday morning, I injured my back, and so I was laid up for a couple days. There was a lot of prayer going on. There was a lot of conversation with God. Very few people are doing that. One generation down to the next. And it's up to us to try to reverse that trend, hold the line, but that means that we have to interact with the youth and minister to them. And one of the things that comes out is that we have to actually preach the entire word of God. In the very first verse in Genesis 1, 1, where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, all the way to our favorite verse, John 3, 16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. There was some research that was done that was trying to find out where is it that we're losing our kids? Are we losing them in college? When they go off to college, is that why they're falling away? And they realized, no, by the time they were in college, they had already decided they were going to leave the church. So then they looked, well, maybe it's in high school. Are we losing them in high school? They realized, no, in high school, they've already pretty much checked out if they're going to check out. So they looked at middle school. Now, in middle school, they've already checked out if they're going to check out. It is upper elementary age kids, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, where kids start realizing and recognizing whether what they're being told about the Bible explains their world as they know and experience it or not. And they also can perceive if the adults that are telling them about this really believe what they're saying or if it's just a facade. Is this just an act? And it comes out in really pragmatic, practical ways. This is a contentious verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that isn't what normally gets said, is it? Normally, it's in the beginning there was a big bang. And that's where everything came from, right? So then the questions start coming. Can we answer the questions? Is this really what happened? Did God really create the heavens and the earth? And they start questioning the truth of our origin. Now, interestingly enough, if you run through the calculations in the Old Testament, God created the heavens and the earth happened just 6,027 years ago. That's not very long. That's a dissonance if you ever read an article about the asteroid that impacted the Earth and killed off all the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. It doesn't take a mathematical genius to realize that if God created the Earth 6,027 years ago, the Earth wasn't around with dinosaurs to be destroyed 65 million years ago. And 4th, 5th, and 6th graders can determine one of these is true, the other one can't be. They start doing some digging and inquiring. They try to figure out which one of these explains the world better. And by and large, the church has dropped the ball, not just our church, but I mean the entire church, and has lost that. Remember Genesis 1 is followed by Genesis 2 and 3. And Genesis 3 is where we learn about how man got corrupted because they sinned in the garden. And therein begins the story of the gospel message. It starts with us needing a redeemer. But if we don't believe what it says in Genesis 1 and 2, why should we believe in Genesis 3? Do we really need a redeemer? And if we're not teaching that God actually created the earth and he created it good, and that we were all originally good, but then we got corrupted, 
Well, I guess what? We don't need that verse. See, we all were created to be good and in perfect harmony with all the rest of creation and our Creator. But because of the death that came through sin, we need a Redeemer. That's why it's important that God loved the world. Because He created it, and He loved it, He wanted to redeem it from its corruption. That's why He sent His Son, the Redeemer, so that whoever believes in Jesus should not perish but have eternal life. You know, young children experience death when their grandparents and great-grandparents start dying and they go to their first funeral. I'll never forget my very first funeral. I was only five years old. I had been left at home for all the other funerals. My grandpa George, he had his funeral when I was just three months old, and my parents found a babysitter to watch me while they were at my grandpa George's funeral on a 95 degree hot day. Because in addition to all the men wearing their suit coats expiring in the pews, they didn't need a three month old caterwauling, crying, and fussing as well. So I didn't, wasn't there for that funeral, and I missed several other ones, but I do remember when my grandmother died at the, when I was only five years old. She was 62, so she died really young. But I didn't realize how young 62 was when I was five because she seemed really old to me. But she was young. And I remember we went through and had regular funeral service, and then we went out to the graveyard, which was right outside the Lutheran Church, Sweet Valley Lutheran Church in Iowa, where half of my ancestors are buried. And we had a graveside service. And no one knows or remembers exactly who, but one of my cousins or someone in my family asked at the conclusion of the graveside service, is she buried yet? And we are all fortunate because my uncle was a Lutheran minister, and so he had some measure of authority in the group there. And he said, you know, we need to show the kids what happens he realized that this was our first brush with it. And so he ordered them to go ahead and lower her into, lower the casket down into the vault. They sealed up the vault, and then a couple wheelbarrows of dirt, they started backfilling the grave. And at this point, all of us were peering around the side. It's amazing that none of us fell in. We joined her in the grave, but we didn't. But we realized at that point, very viscerally, like, Oh, this is death. Like she's gone and she's now under. And there's a separation that takes place. It was five years later, my great-grandmother passed away. It was actually my grandmother's mother. She outlived her own daughter by five or six years. And that was the second funeral I attended. And it was in December. And we had finished the graveside service and then we all walked away. And I was like, didn't finish it. What in the world? They're supposed to put her down in the ground. And my mother had explained to me that's not normal. That was an aberration. But man, you ever want to screw a kid up? You do the first time they experience something wrong, and then it's never right ever again for their whole <coughs> So, one of the things I enjoy actually being a preacher and having to do with cemetery uh, services is I get to be there uh, all the way to when the casket goes down. So I finally am around to see the final draw like it's supposed to be in my mind because I was five when it was taught to me. You see, children understand death even at a younger age than we would expect. They would start to recognize the separation. They realize that death is a bad thing and that each of us needs to be saved from that. That's why we need Jesus. So we don't perish but instead have I'm going to close here this morning, a little longer than I expected. We'll do the other half of this next week. Look at energizing the service. One of the things we need to do as a congregation is figure out how we can start ministering to the youth in our community. We need to connect with them. We need to get to know them. We need to build a relationship with them. Not just a handful of them, but a good number of them. And then we need to start learn how to teach them what the Bible actually says. 
uh, something you can join in prayer with me on. Is how is it that we can minister to the youth in our community? It's going to be a team effort. Let's go ahead and close the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your many blessings in our life. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your leading in our church. We thank you for the direction. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you be teaching and showing each and every one of us how we can begin ministering to the youth in our community. Lord, there are well over a thousand in our school district alone. And there are other school districts that are very close by that we can connect to as well. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us an open avenue of ministry, that we would be able to get, begin ministering to a larger number of youth in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Holy Spirit give you creative ideas this week and impress upon you the importance of parenting.